you for coming, folks. Uh, thank you to everyone who will eventually see this on YouTube. Uh, for those of you that haven't met me yet, uh, my name is Brandon Crilly. I'm one of the uh, senior programmers for uh, Canpod SF, along with uh, my other senior programmer, Evan May, who's actually in the audience, so you can't see them. Uh, and I'm here with our author guest of honor, Kevin Hearn, um, author of The Iron Druid Chronicles and The Tales of Hell, um, and the Seven Kennings books, and um, other things that I've um, so we're going to, I've got a bunch of uh, questions here that we're going to go over, we can go off script, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna, so we're just going to chat for a bit, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for uh, audience questions. Um, so we'll start off with some stuff, and then um, I've got some rapid fire questions at the end, but I will prepare you ahead of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no fresh water. No. Rapid fire. Um, so first, first of all, thank you for coming, because I know uh, you. you've been mentioning on social media that you're in the midst of working on A Blade of Black Wings, which is the second yeah. seven canning book, right? Um, yeah. may, I, I, may I ask how it's going? Well, it's going great. I'm on schedule so far. Okay, good. Um, I have to get uh, 180,000 words done by the end of January, and I'm currently at 70,000. So I'm sticking to the schedule so far. Um, I have to copy edit No Country for Old Gnomes ah, yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> this week, though, as well. And, uh, and get that to my co-author, Delilah S. Dawson. And then we are also going to get edits on the third book, The Princess Beard. And so that's all coming this month on top of me trying to keep my word count going. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I'm super busy. Uh, and I also got three invitations to anthologies and stuff like that this Seriously? month. Like, yeah, I was, I was like, where, where were these the rest of the year? They all came. <laughs> like, uh, on two days, I got three different invitations. It's just weird bunching of things, and I, I had to wind up saying no to a couple of things, because I, I don't know where I could fit it in, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, that, it's going great so far. I, I'm, I'm enjoying it, and uh, uh, it is a lot to juggle, but I'm, yeah. I'm enjoying the challenge. It's fun. So I, I mean, it's a common question for writers, but how do you balance all that, especially with you know, these seven invites and anthologies? Yeah, I have to, um, well, I, I do one project at a time, okay. um, and but then I'll, I'll be able to come back, because I outline, thankfully, uh, right. I'm able to come back and, and get myself into things if I need to, keep organized. Okay. But the editing stuff, when that lands in your inbox, you know, you it's time sensitive. You have to uh, get it back soon because it has to go into production. So right. um, I can't put that off. No, you know? for sure. So, so yeah, uh, the word count unfortunately suffers sometimes because when, you know, edits will land. Yeah. But you just got to do it fast and get it back and then you're, you know, back yeah. to drafting. Absolutely. Um, and I read that uh, for a blade of black wings, you're balancing. There's 12 POV characters. In that? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's <laughs> 12, like, <laughs> 12 first person points of view. Okay. And uh, I I use Scrivener. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Because Scrivener allows you to basically create uh, fun little tabs for every character. Okay. Uh, little folders, I guess. If you yeah. Okay. Hold up. Uh, or collections. That's what they're called. That, okay. That's the technical term. They're called collections. And um, so what I do is I, I, I assign every character their own collection. Okay. And so then I can write in one character's voice, they've got like say five chapters or something like that, and then I am able to write that all in one voice and so that way I'm not head hopping as I'm drafting. Right, okay. I, I, I stay in one voice and get all of that one character done. But then uh, what I'm able to do is, is take all of those collections and spread them out through the document, you right, know, okay. in different orders. So I'm not writing sequentially. Right. Okay. I'm writing sequentially in the character's yeah, voice, yeah, yeah. but not sequentially uh, throughout the book. So okay. being able to do that non-linearly is, well, it's basically making it possible. There's no way I would yeah. be able to do this in Microsoft Word. No, for sure. Yeah, it, there's, oh my God. The, the uh, copying um, and pasting and scrolling that you would need to do to, yeah. to do something like this, no way. Scrivener makes it possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you, you must have done a ton of prep work ahead of time to be able to go like one character's narrative like to make sure that everything's consistent, or is that yes. for later? Yeah, you. I, I have a pretty detailed outline okay. for things, um, and so that outline informs uh, you know the drafting later on, yeah. and uh, then I have to put a frame into it later you know, to make sure it really does all stick together. And, uh, but I, I ran the, the outline of, of the stories by my editor to make sure that, you know, this works. And then uh, the frame will, you know, kind of put the finishing touch on things. Yeah, okay, so cool. Um, is it, I mean, it must be a much different process than Iron Druid Chronicles. Yeah, it is. Um, like, has your process changed significantly since book one, since Hounded? Oh yeah, it has quite a bit. Well, Hounded was, um, 
Hounded was written by the seat of the pants kind of style oh, really? that everybody talks about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I did not have an editor or a contract or a deadline or anything like that. I was, right. I was just writing to amuse myself. And so um, I, I could stop and do research for days and days and not worry about it because I, I just wanted to figure things out as mm-hmm. I went. So that was actually kind of fun, but yeah. it's not a practical way to do things when you do have deadlines. Uh, you uh, So right. having an outline uh, helped me uh, become much faster, right. and uh, it, it, which is a good thing because you don't get paid until you finish. So uh, you, you want to be able to get faster at it and do you know, kind of two books a year if you can. Right, okay. uh, for for those for that genre that works, you, you yeah. can maintain I think two books a year if okay. if you want to do it. Um, but yeah, there's no way I could do an epic, you know, two epics in a year. Right. Those take sure. much longer, uh-huh. you know. So they're they're two to three times the size of, of an Iron Druid book. So right, right. Um, yeah, you just have to take a little bit longer at it. Was there ever any like getting to uh, book nine? After Iron Druid yeah. came in this year, that's huge. Like, like that, is, I, I think I'm right in saying that that's a milestone that not every author is able to hit, finishing off that length of series, so congrats. Thank you. Yeah, I noted at the time, I said, I'm probably not doing this again. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> getting to a nine-book series, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't know. Okay. Uh, but, but I mean, it, it's it's a, it's something that, it's a big enough series where you think, you, how many more nine-book series you got in you, you know what okay, I mean? It, it's So it, no, like... What's Jim Butcher doing? Fifteen or twenty or something? Well, yeah, yeah, he he's doing uh, an incredible work there, but but I I, I don't I'm personally I, I don't want to write something that long. Um, so uh, because I actually don't read a lot of stuff that's over, you know, double okay. digits. Uh, I've never read The Wheel of Time because by the time I really kind of start hearing about it stuff, it's mm. already ten books or something. Mm. Uh, like that's a lot of time. I don't have that much time to, yeah. to invest. <laughs> so so since as a reader, okay. I don't want to tackle something that big. Yeah. I think as a writer, I never wanted to get to ten. Okay. That's um, but also nine was a really big deal in yeah. Irish mythology. Okay. So um, I wanted to make that series nine books to keep consistent with the character who's telling the story. Okay. What's uh, the significance of nine in Irish mythology? In that? It, <laughs> If, if you go back and you read the Irish myths, whenever they had to do something important, they did it in multiples of nine. It was nine days, nine weeks, nine months, nine years. It didn't matter. Interesting. And, and you just see nine coming up all the time in those old stories. And so I figured a character from that culture would also tell his own story in nine installments. And then I promptly cheated by, <laughs> by having novellas and, and short stories and things like that as well. But nine actual novels. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Was there ever a concern at any point um, that maybe you wouldn't make it to the end, either because of writer's block, or, or, or were, were you confident that you'd be able to get to the end of book nine? Oh yeah, I was confident after after book three. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, when I first started Hounded, I just didn't know how long I would be able to go. Right, okay. Like, because I didn't know if it would sell or not. Right, of course. And so um, I, I wrote Hounded so that it could be a standalone in case it did bomb. And then, you know, people would have sort of an all-in-one story, and that's fine. Right, okay. But um, I, I wrote Hexed and Hammered. You know, they gave me a three-book contract, so I wrote all three. And then I had to wait to see if they sold or not right. before they let me sell or write any more. And so, uh, thankfully, folks bought them, and I was allowed to write more. And that's when I planned to have the nine books because okay. I knew that I could. Because um, the first three books you could also look at as just sort of right. contained uh, story if you'd like. Uh, but things uh, transition in uh, book four and then we're getting into you know the longer arc uh, from there. And uh, yeah, okay. plan to get there. Okay, good. cool. That. Awesome. Um, is there ever a, like we've discussed already all the projects that you're working on right now, is there ever a threshold in your mind of, okay, if I do this, I'm going to be too busy? Well, yeah, it was like when I get some of these invitations to, to these really cool, you know, projects, and I, and I, I hate to say no, yeah. well, but I, yeah. but I kind of have to because I, I have so much else going on in my mind, I, I don't think I could really, it, you just don't know how long it will take you to do right, a enough. project necessarily, and, and sometimes it might go really fast, but uh, it might be a really long slog too, yeah. just depending. Uh, and so you have to, uh, when you do have a lot of stuff on your plate that you're contracted for, that obviously has to take precedence. 
right. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you allowed to say anything about what these anthologies might be? Or are you sworn to secrecy still? Um, no pressure. Like, I don't want to. Well, I can tell you about what a couple that are. Right <laughs> yeah, I can tell you one that's coming up. Uh, a couple of them. Okay. Um, uh, one is about to be announced. By the time you get this on YouTube, I'm sure it will be. Okay. Just let me know if I should hold off. No, no. It, I, it's called Resist. Okay. And it's a huge Hawken, um, a, a really huge anthology full of short stories by sci-fi fantasy writers. All on the theme of resistance to the current American administration. Ah, yes. All proceeds from it go to benefit the American Civil Liberties Union. No way. So uh, we we have all donated our stories, okay. their original stories, uh, and so you're getting all new stuff, and it benefits the ACLU. That's cool. And yeah, it's coming out very soon, and um, they're going to do it through Humble Bundle first. Okay. And then it'll be on sale via you know the the regular ebook stuff uh, outlets, Amazon, whatever. On election day, <laughs> so, uh, so that's coming out very soon, right? In the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't kidding. Yeah. Um, and then I have uh, Death and Honey coming out in February with Chuck Wendig and Delilah S. Dawson. No way. And and it is uh, it, it's going to be the last Oberon's meaty mystery. It's going to be uh, it's going to be called the Buzzkill. Everything is related to bees in this one okay. because we had done an, an anthology together earlier where every story had cheese wizards. Yes. And uh, <laughs> it's just because I thought there hadn't been a themed cheese wizard <laughs> anthology yet, we needed to do that. Uh, and now we've got one on bees, and so uh, I'm, I'm very looking forward to it. The cover has already been announced by Subterranean Press, oh, cool. or released, I shouldn't say announced. And it's beautiful. It's by Galen Vera. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that one coming out next year. And uh, in terms of other things that I've just agreed to, I don't think I can, I, I can say yet okay, because that, there's no contract and stuff. Right? Yeah, no, yeah, don't jeopardize that. That's yeah, not right. A bad idea. Yeah, but I, but I have a couple other things on the burner for okay. later on. All right, cool. Um, I'll, I'm gonna come back to, to three slices because I, when I was researching that, it sounds <laughs> okay. absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but it, it, that resist anthology sounds really cool. Yeah. Do you think that? Like, do you think that writers, and we'll say specifically in sci-fi and fantasy, have a significant voice in that sort of medium in terms of raising awareness and resistance? Like, like do you think that, like, how important are we in that scheme, for lack of a better phrase? This one's written, not written down, so I just... I, I don't know how important we are. I, okay. I hope we're important to some folks somewhere, but um, I, I kind of don't want to know how important we are because then you, that might, you know, affect my ego. Okay, I really don't want to know, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I don't want to go around thinking I'm important, but uh, okay. I, I just want to uh, go ahead and, and, and do one little thing, you know, tell a story that, that I felt uh, like telling, yeah. um, and it, it, I, I hope it resonates with somebody somewhere. Okay. Um, and, and it's a Grania Whale story that I, that I wrote uh, of her and Orla um, going out into... Uh, the, the river, uh, the Animus River near Durango, Colorado, you, you might not know about it, but it got polluted really badly a few years ago okay. by the EPA. They were trying to clean a mine, and they oh. didn't. Uh, they basically let loose all the tailings into the river, Ooh. and they have ruined it with heavy metals, and it is, it is a huge, toxic mess. And it was running orange. It was just, it was, it was nasty. It ruined not only wildlife in the river, but, you know, tourism in the area and so on. And um, they've got a long cleanup ahead of them. So, right. um, so I wrote about that project, uh, having Grindy Whale and uh, go down by that river and check it out. It's kind of heartbreaking to see it. Yeah, yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. Interesting. So. I like the yeah, no, that's a good point about ego. I mean, yeah, we don't want to get too uh, <laughs> yeah, full I, of ourselves, I guess, for lack yeah, of Yeah, I have no idea how, how much uh, influence we actually have. I, I do know that uh, I think when sci fi and fantasy winds up getting into the mainstream via TV or movies. It has perhaps more of an impact, but of okay. course that, you know, because you're reaching a wider audience right. that way. Um, but but I, I don't know uh, otherwise uh, how it's really shaping things. It might have an outsized influence in, in the sense that a lot of times um, the people who are uh, in the tech industry mm -hmm. are sci-fi fantasy readers. Yeah. And so they're the ones who are kind of Really shaping our modern world, and perhaps there's a, a, a bit of an outsized influence there. Yeah, that makes sense. But, I, 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 oh, sorry, but, but I, yeah, I just don't know how much, how many 
policymakers are sci-fi right. fantasy readers. <laughs> That's exactly and, and, and maybe if more of them read the genre, maybe maybe we would have more influence in that regard. <laughs> So, uh, so that we need to throw books at politicians. Uh, Not don't throw books at politicians. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe ask them to read uh, more than the, the current nonfiction. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So amongst the other stuff that you have coming up, um, you announced online at one point that um, <coughs> once you are done Blade of Black Wings, that you have something planned within the Iron Druid Chronicles universe. Yeah. Okay. Um, are can you? Any previously unmentioned tidbits that you could tell us about here, just between colleagues, that yeah. or everybody else? No, I, 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 I can tell. I can tell a little bit about it. I mean, I, I will uh, announce it. Uh, I've already signed the contract, you know, and I can say stuff, I guess, if I want. But okay. um, I, I, I've been hesitant to say a lot just because I can't even get started on it until next right. year. Oh, that's fair. And, and, it, and it's kind of say, hey guys, I'll be writing this someday. Doesn't sound <laughs> as exciting as I'm writing this now. Right. So um, I'm going to be announcing it uh, and, and making a much bigger deal of it in February okay. when I go to do research for it. Oh, okay. I'll be going to Scotland. It'll be set in Glasgow. Uh, well, at least parts of it. Uh, the majority of it is set in Glasgow, but things will happen around the world. Uh, and it is in the Iron Druid universe. And uh, the main character, however, is not a druid, or a werewolf, or a witch, or uh, it, not anything maybe someone is, might be expecting. Uh, this is a character that showed up in one short story in the collection that I came out with called Besieged. Okay. And uh, this character has two whole lines. But, but, but this character kept bugging me, like, after the fact, like, what, what is that guy's deal? And, and, and I, I wanted to, to, to kind of explore this character more. I found myself drawn to this character that I brought in and kind of created as kind of a, a crazy little <coughs> sideshow. And um, I wrote a chapter okay. featuring this character, and it was so much fun awesome. that I, I knew I had a new series on my hands. So uh, this new series will be in the same universe, and you know they they know about you know the druids and so on and so forth, but they're not really having anything to do with the druids, and they uh, they have a completely different magic system. So uh, which I had a blast coming up with, and I actually have to do some experiments in my basement. My wife has already given me permission. <laughs> so so uh, I can't wait to get started on that. Did she have uh, all the details of it? No, no, I was purposely vague. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't want to be very specific about it, but um, yeah, so, so we're going to Scotland uh, in February to do a lot of location uh, scouting and stuff like that. And then uh, we'll also be doing some experiments in the basement to, to get some things right and or wrong. <laughs> to find out what doesn't work is also very important. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then uh, in February, when I'm basically in Scotland and uh, and doing the research, I'll talk a lot more about the series right, for sure. and, and what's going to be coming. Okay, and cool. uh, we'll be able to tell you more about it then. Awesome. Okay, well, I, yeah. I appreciate you giving us that little... Uh, glimpse. Yeah, you could figure it out. If you went to read Besieged, you could probably figure it out based on what I've said here. Okay. Uh, who the new character will be. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go back into that and see if I can figure it out. Yeah. All right. You bet. Um, okay, I want to ask you about Three Slices, which you already mentioned. Sure. Uh, which is the mini anthology with Delilah Dawson and, and Chuck Wendig. Yeah. Um, so I read, uh, as I was researching for this, um, on Wendig's blog, he explains how this anthology came about. <laughs> and he describes it as, and I quote, um, the three of us were in the desert last year, tripping balls on mescal and tabs that we dissolved in cheap tequila, and we had just fought the Coyote King. Is that accurate? What's your version? Of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Chuck, Chuck might have done that, um, okay. and, but but I I didn't personally uh, do any of that. He he has a tendency to perhaps exaggerate and write fiction, uh, but but. Uh, what, what had happened is that I, I heard about this term called a tyromancer, and uh, it, it's basically a, it's somebody who tells the future by looking at cheese curds as they form, and, and uh, they're seeing patterns of the future in the, the curdling cheese. And I thought, well, that's, there's a Wikipedia article about it. Like, like there are people who actually practice this as an art. And I'm like, that's so amazing, that's awesome. Why aren't there any s stories about cheese wizards, man? And it turns out that uh, a, a few years after this, or a couple of years after we came out with it, um, The Witcher 
uh, one mm-hmm. of the Witcher uh, games, yeah. Witcher Three, perhaps. Okay. There's an episode with a cheese wizard. Like you, you oh, have to late. battle a cheese wizard in there. And, and uh, uh, so anyway, we we uh, just wanted to do it because we could. We wanted to self-publish. We we didn't ever try to get it published. We just didn't. We thought we'd be laughed at. You know, haha, <laughs> nobody's gonna publish a cheese wizard anthology. So we just went ahead and self-published it for fun. Okay. And uh, you know, it's it's done great, and uh, we we love the stories, and uh, we got some artwork to put in there by Galen Darren. Uh, it, it's a really cool thing, and then we also got the audiobook uh, uh, narrated as well. So it's available on ebook and audio, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It, it, and so mine is part of the Iron Druid. My my right. novella there is part of the Iron Druid Chronicles. And Chuck is part of his uh, his novella is part of the um, Miriam Black series. Mm-hmm. And then Delilah has a novella from her Blood series, B L U D, and so uh, we all did something that works with our series together, and uh, but but uh, was thematically grouped, so it, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. That's yeah, very cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump to Tales of Pell, which, sure. which I gotta ask about it as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is that you and Delilah you trade chapters back and forth, and yeah. that there's not a whole lot of pre planning. We we do plan a little bit down the road, like we we need to know where we're starting and where we're ending. Right, of course. But then we wow, it, it goes all over the place in the middle. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so how does how does that work? Like, well, we we uh, well, first of all, this started out in the Dallas airport. Uh, we were waiting okay. for our flights, and in we we had an hour to kill, so we went to this airport barbecue joint, which I don't recommend. <laughs> but okay. we had. Uh, some um, you know just we were, we were really jazzed about uh, uh, the sighting we'd had the night before and uh, we were feeling really creative and and and, uh, and, and maybe a little bit loopy and so uh, we, we just wanted to start flipping tropes we were talking about you know what can we do to to mess around with some tropes and I said kill the farm boy because that stupid farm boy is always going around and uh, messing up the empire whatever it is yeah. you know from Luke Skywalker to you know any epic fantasy you might imagine and uh, it, it really is a white male power fantasy that that particular story uh, arc, right? Is that you got a kid on a farm and he is told, no, 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 you're not a poor farm boy. You're actually somebody super important, and uh, you got to go on a quest and you'll make it happen, man. So that's cool, uh, but it's been repeated a lot. And and so what happens is that you get all these other characters that never get their stories told, right? So Kill the Farm Boy was an opportunity for us to, to really explore uh, the stories of everybody else. Okay. And um, we, we had a, a great time with our, our, our sort of, uh, somebody called them our, our group of uh, D20 fails. Like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> roll a one, you know, and, and you've got these, uh, basically a and d party that, that are of, of these misfit characters who uh, kind of wind up going on a goofy little quest and, okay. and the chosen one is not the farm boy, although he thinks it's him. And uh, it, it's a, a very uh, fun little quest. Uh, it, and then, so we wrote this, we came up with this whole world pell uh, that we then uh, can write other adventures in. And so the second book is No Country for Old Boats. Yes. And then the third is The Princess Beard. So uh, they have these beautiful covers on them. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, amazing. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. So, yeah. so we, we, we've uh, we're, we're lovingly poking fun at epic fantasy, uh, but uh, it's only because we love epic fantasy so much that mm-hmm. we want to make fun of it. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, I hope folks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Are we gonna see like any uh, Javier Bardem lookalikes walking around in No Country for Old Men? Maybe a little Tommy Lee Jones in there. No, none of that stuff no. is actually happening. Uh, but uh, the there's a there is a goth gnome. And okay. uh, it's about time, right? <laughs> uh, we, we, we're, we have a goth gnome in there, and uh, we have a griffin um, who's okay. uh, obsessed with eggs, uh, okay. and and then uh, and omelets and stuff like that. We have uh, an ovatar, you know, a uh, half sheep, half human. Okay. And uh, we we also have uh, a dwarf in there uh, who could talk to bees, and we we have. Uh, uh, another uh, a, a bristle witch, uh, who uh, she she pulls out her beard, yes, and uh, she she'll mutter a curse and then swallow that hair that she pulls out of her beard. Okay, and uh, for effectiveness, <laughs> that's how she does her magic. Okay, and uh, you know, so she has to worry about you know uh, balancing out the need for magic versus the need to have a nice full beard. 
Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a struggle. Yeah, no, that, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So uh, we, we have a lot of fun uh, with, with the characters throughout and, and, and poking fun at fantasy tropes. And, uh, and the halflings are uh, not what you would call savory characters. Okay. Uh, in, in No Country for Old Gnomes. It's basically a war going on between the gnomes and the, and the halflings. Okay. And uh, it's a lot of fun. That's cool. Yeah. Did you begin that, that white male power fantasy trope? Is that still too prevalent today? Is it still really prevalent in like current fantasy coming up, do you think? I think that um, that I don't read them anymore. Okay, um, fair enough. That I've, I've, I've seen enough of them that I that's a story that um, I don't need to be told again. Okay, yeah. Um, and, and I'm not really interested in stories that are... Um, that are, that are basically going to tell me this, just the same thing over and over again. So I'm very excited that science fiction and fantasy is now telling quite a few yeah. different stories. Mm -hmm. And I love this time. I think we're kind of in a golden age right now yeah, uh, in, in the kinds of stories that you can uh, read out there. Uh, um, the City of Brass by S.A. Oh, Chakraborty, so that amazing, right? right? And, and that's, so that's not your yeah. typical white no, man power right? fantasy, right? And I had no idea where it was going. Yeah. I was surprised by the end. I'm like, yeah. there's more of this, yeah. right? And we're getting more of that. So yeah. I, I love that uh, we're, we're moving into different kinds of stories now. Yeah. And, and, and uh, as a reader, I am jazzed. And, uh, and, and as a writer, I, I also know that I can tell different stories, yeah. too. So it, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think Hollywood, I think, is still trying to catch up. So we see, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like adaptations and stuff. That, you know, let, let's adapt Lord of the Rings again. Let's adapt this. Right. And, I was talking online with some authors about City of Brass. Like, I want to see a TV show of City of Brass. Yeah. Or a movie or something, because it's such a phenomenal. Go read City of Brass after you read all of Kevin's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, please it's really do. Phenomenal. It's fantastic. Um, okay, before I do my rapid fire, I want to ask you really quickly about Shakespeare. Shakespeare? Like, with, <laughs> if anyone doesn't know this, it, it, it's Kevin watching um, Shake, a, a film ad adaptation of Shakespeare and a hockey game, like a live hockey game, simultaneously. Am I uh, this right? Uh, yes. And then tweeting about it. Yes, uh, because How, yeah, how did yeah. that happen? <laughs> I was goofing around, and I was uh, basically I I had uh, I I can't stand a lot of commercials okay. be because they're the same ones for sports. It doesn't matter if you're watching right. football or hockey. You're going to get trucks and pizza and financial services, right? And, and I was like, uh, okay, I've like seen all the yeah yeah subway whatever. You, yeah. you get the same stuff, and I. And I I don't want to watch that. So when and I don't really want a lot of commentary from Don Cherry either. So I'm going to switch uh, and uh, watch something else during the intermissions. Okay. So I started watching uh, Jane Austen. Actually, is oh, what okay. I, I was doing first. I was watching uh, Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, nice. and I did those. And then I switched to Shakespeare after I got done with those. Yeah. And uh, then I people were saying, you know. The, it's nice, but can you come up with a hashtag, please, so that I can mute the hashtag and not get spammed? <laughs> so you know, not get spammed with your hockey and Shakespeare all night because they, you know, apparently they wanted something else from their Twitter feed. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, yeah, that's why I came up with the hashtag Shakespuck so that folks could, you know, uh, ignore me. And, uh, and 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 yeah, and that. But that's that's cool because you know, yeah, I don't want to spam your feed. I don't want to. You know, no, be bugging sure. you. So uh, yeah, I'll just tag my stuff, and then that way, um, everybody who wants to follow along can have fun with it. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun to yeah. do, to do it, honestly, uh, because uh, I, I also like I just like the juxtaposition of, of of Shakespeare play, and then guys just bashing into each other oh, with yeah. as much kinetic force as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> yeah, I found it afterwards. It's hilarious just to read through it. Like, so will you do it again at any point? Do you think? Uh, or was it just kind of a goofing around? I, I might, yeah, I might, I, I might have to come up with a movie that I really want to comment on, ah, fair um, and, and then uh, do it with uh, some sort of uh, usually playoff hockey is what, right? You know, right. But I might uh, do something during the regular season. You never know. Whatever the mood strikes. Yeah. Okay. Fair yeah. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do some rapid fire questions. Sure. Which I totally stole this concept from Larry King now, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, I'm going to ask you some really quick questions. First thing that comes to your head, don't think about it. Okay. And don't cheat. Okay, I won't. <laughs> and then we'll have time for some audience questions uh, sure. to wrap this up if anyone has any. Fair. So, are you ready? Yeah, I, I hope so. Okay. Again, don't overthink it. All right. Okay. Um, what is Shakespeare's greatest play? Hamlet. Okay. Yeah. 
Do you want me to go on? Or no, 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 it's fine. Maybe, maybe, maybe if we have time. The rapid fire is going no, to be sorry, great yeah, here. No, it's going to be terrible. Sorry. Yeah. Um, your favorite Norse deity? Um, oh, the, don't the, the Udler. The okay. guy with skis. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, what the scariest fame? Uh, the Morrigan scares the crap out of me. Okay. All right. Uh, best part of being a writer? Uh, well, no pants. <laughs> <laughs> no what? Everybody says that. <laughs> no what? No yes. pants. Okay, you go to work without pants on. Everybody says that. Yeah. Well, it's true. No, I don't. I wear pants, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, worst part of being a writer? Oh, um, good reads. Oh, yeah, okay. no, that's fair. I'll give you that. Uh, the, you know, the reviews that appear before you've written the book. Oh, yeah. That, that's what I mean. Not, yeah, not good no. reads all over. Just just the reviews that, that have already reviewed your book before you've written it. Yeah. I don't know how that's possible. Maybe the, I just don't get it. I don't know. Um, childhood celebrity crush. Oh, I, geez. Um, somebody with big hair in the 80s. I, okay, I can't right, remember right, right, the right, name right, now. Right, yeah. right. Um, best whiskey for a whiskey sour? Or oh. a whiskey sour... Like Jeez, uh, I would, I I'd say uh, Knob Creek Reserve or or Woodford Reserve. Yeah, how do you spell that? Knob Creek. Yeah. Not K N O B. Okay. Creek. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And then what was the second one? Woodford just, just Research. Woodford Reserve. Woodford. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> fine. Everything's fine. Um, something you've never written and you're not sure you could pull it off. I haven't written a straight up like mystery slash thriller kind of thing yet. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm edging towards mysteries. I really think they're fun, but I don't have enough of a criminal <laughs> mind yet to really sort of do a, a, a murder mystery kind of thing. I love you say yet. Uh, yet. <laughs> I, well, yeah, you, you can practice, right? You can practice thinking about uh, homicides, for, I suppose. For reasons of internet, I'm not going right. to I'm not gonna fit to anything. Yeah, and, and so I, 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 want, I would like to try it sometime and get there to that. Okay. It's a completely different genre, obviously, but... Um, you know, that, that's something I, I would like to edge toward, uh, but at this moment I haven't managed to do it. Okay, fair enough. Um, author you go to for advice? If there, if there is one. Uh, an author I go to for advice? Yeah, for yourself. Um, I, I actually like Chuck Wendig a lot. I mean, I love his writing advice. I love, uh, because he often puts into words things that I've been doing unconsciously, and I, and I sort of superstitiously don't think too hard about my process. Okay. Because I don't want to mess it up. Oh. So, uh, but then he'll say it, and then I'll go, oh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. That's the word for what I do. So, um, I like uh, his writing books, and then his writing blog, of course, as well. Oh, yeah. I, they're, they're great. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Best book you read recently besides City of Friends? Uh, okay. Uh, I just got done with Nemesis Games by James S. A. Corey. Oh, okay. And I bought it a couple of years ago, but that's how bad my, my, my to be read list nice. is. <laughs> and uh, I just got back to it, and oh, man, I devoured that thing. So okay. good. And so I, I've ordered the next two Battlelands Ashes and Persepolis Rising. Awesome. So, yeah, fantastic stuff. Right. Um, new or up and coming writer you admire? I, I really like S. H. Hackerborn. Okay. Uh, yeah. the, the, the one we've been talking about, the City of Brass. We can't recommend that enough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, and there's a bunch, uh, Tasha Suri, okay. uh, has, has written a really cool book, um, that's coming out, um, and, uh, I'm spacing some others and I'm, I'm going to feel guilty about it for the rest of the day now. That's but yeah, there, there's we, a we lot can, of, we, we can record a second one later. Yeah, probably. there's, there's a lot of great new writers that are coming up, uh, as we were talking about, it's yeah. a, it's a golden age of new stuff and, um, I'm really digging it. Yeah. Okay. And last one. Um, if you could look at the camera and say one thing to either Chuck Wendig or Delilah Dawson, what would it be? And feel free to do it. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, homies, you got to move up where I'm at. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, perfect. <laughs> we can hang out more. Do you, do you find it's really tough about being a writer that like you have friends all over the place and you only ever see each other at a con and, and everybody's working and busy? Like, yeah, it, that is a bummer uh, that you only get to see uh, some of your writer friends every so often at cons. Um, if you're, you know, sometimes you you'll have a bunch of stuff coming out in a certain year, and they do too, and it just matches and it works great. Um, but. You know, there's some years where I'll see them three times, you know, yeah. and some years I don't see them at all. It just yeah. depends. Um, that is a rough bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, this question at the front. Uh, yeah, I think when I first started reading Hounded, I, I think you were still working as a teacher when you were writing? Yeah. 
are are you now considered like are you now a full time writer? Or are you yes. still yeah? I wrote my first five books uh, while I was still a full time teacher, and then I became a full time writer after that. And I keep telling my wife I'm going to get another job, and she she keeps telling me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, Your job is writing now, so you know. But but I I think that um, I I would like to get something just 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 to get out of your own space for a little while and, and, and meet other folks and so on just if it was part time or whatever I have to figure out what that thing would be but you know it, I think that there's value to having a day job I, you know what I mean that, that's the, uh, the dream for a lot of folks is to get rid of the day job which is a great dream because hey no pants but at the same time um, it, it's great to be stimulated by you know something besides your own house and uh, you, you've got to get out, you know, and, and meet folks, and you know, and that's the fodder for the stories, you know. Um, and and uh, the Iron Druid Chronicles was set in Tempe, where I grew up, and I knew this city, and I was out in it a lot, and and I worked there, lived there, and all that. So that proved to be uh, a great genesis for a series. Well, if you're, you know, if all you know is your tiny little room or whatever, or maybe the coffee shop you go uh -huh. right at. What are you really experiencing, and how are you being stimulated to write something new? So um, that's why I, I, I kind of keep toying with the idea of getting another job or something like that, um, because I, I do think there's value in, in having uh, that outside experience. Long-winded answers. This is what you get when you, when you ask me a question. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but like, would you go back to teaching, or you think something totally different? Oh no, I wouldn't go back to teaching. I not because I, I love the kids, but uh, there was nothing about taking attendance that I ever liked, uh, or going to a faculty meeting. Or, you know, a lot of the administrative stuff of teaching, all the stuff that's not teaching. Yes, that's the part that I don't miss and don't want to go back to. Um, and plus, it's you know, it is a thing where you really have to be locked into a schedule there. Yeah. And um, I couldn't go out and travel for writing if I wanted to, uh, right. if I was doing teaching. So uh, I would need something a lot more flexible uh, if I was going to do something else. Yeah, fair enough. Sure. Yeah. Advice on structuring a novel you have for, for writers? Okay. Um, I would, again, go ahead and say structure and install that, because like, like Chuck is, writes really good books about these things that I actually kind of refer to sometimes and think about. But um, in terms of what I do, is I, uh, and everybody's process is different, so me telling you what mine is doesn't mean yeah. this is what you've got to do. It might not work for you at all. Uh, it, this, I just find that this works for me. I write chapter summaries of what happens, but some of those chapter summaries are very short, like Shakespearean stage directions, they fight, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but some of them are much longer and uh, could take up to a page or so because there's a very important stretch of dialogue that develops character and it's a crucial moment uh, for that character that I want to develop a little bit. And so my, my, my outlines wind up being probably uh, eight to ten pages long when I get all done, single spaced, <coughs> when I get done with my chapter summaries and my uh, I usually structure them to be anywhere from 24 to 30 chapters. That gets me, if you're looking for an average of around 3,000 words a chapter, mm -hmm. then that's going to get you around to the 80,000 to 100,000 um, word count mark that you kind of need for the genre. So that's, that's kind of how I look at it, it is uh, if the word count for the genre is 80 to 110 or something like that. You probably need 25 to 30 chapters of 3,000 words to get you there. Cool. So, there you go. You back. Yeah. Anyone else? Last one. Robert? I was wondering about Glasgow and about research in general and, uh, you know, what do you look for when you go to a city like Glasgow? Oh, that's you know. such a great question. Um, because uh, in, in terms of like my personal preference for when I'm reading urban fantasy is that I would like to get to know the city better. Uh, urban fantasies which have completely <coughs> fictional cities, I don't resonate quite as much with me personally. I know that they work great and they tell great stories too, but um, I like to, to know more about the city. So um, I, I make sure that all of my settings are real. So uh, you can really go to Rulabula in Tempe 
and have some of the greatest fish and chips ever. Like you would not expect Arizona to have a great Irish pub, but it is a seriously good pub. I've 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 been to some pubs, <laughs> and 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 this is a fantastic one. They they've got a really good handle on the cuisine there, and um, so so I try to make everything as real as possible. So Tempe is described accurately uh, for the fourth book that happened uh, to be partially set on the Navajo Nation. I went there and I scattered around uh, quite a bit and talked to some folks and so on. And then um, I, I flagstaff the portions there were set there for everything that was set in another country. I either went there or uh, in state, for example, they're in Prague, Berlin, uh, and uh, I think they're also in, in Rome, right? I went to all of those places because wow. I happened to have a tour for Shattered uh, that I was able to do that. The European cool. publisher brought me over. Cool. So then I, I while, while I was uh, in Poland for, for the Polish convention, I just extended it and took some research stops to these other places that I wanted to go. So the hotel that uh, Atticus has a fight in in Berlin with some vampires, that's the hotel I was staying at. <laughs> so I, I, I describe all of these things accurately and you can go visit them. And so uh, since the new series will be in the Iron Druid universe, the same ethic has to apply. I want all of the settings to be accurate. So I need to go to Glasgow to um, see what the town smells like. What does it sound like? And you know, what's the ambient noise going on? What what are you likely to hear or see as you're walking around? How can I describe you know things really accurately using Google Maps? You know, you can get some idea, but until you're there and really experience it with all your five senses and not just what Google Maps is going to show you, I don't think you can accurately really capture a place. So um, I'm going there to. Um, you know, experienced pubs. I've got uh, I've got somebody who's, who has a reliable uh, inside line on the greatest beer there. You walk in and it smells like toast. That's what I've been told, <laughs> and I gotta go. So uh, there, there's stuff like that that I got an experience with, and so I'm really looking forward to it. And um, my wife's going with me, and she's looking forward to it too. She has she has a different agenda. She wants to do some different things. <laughs> so, uh, but we're both gonna have a great time while we're in Scotland. Cool, it's gonna be fantastic. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so that pretty much brings us to our time. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.